<laughs> the meeting is being recorded. And uh, by being present, then you consent uh, that uh, whatever you say may even end up being published. Uh, we have discussed with our colleagues that this could be uh, on the EMC YouTube profile so uh, that uh, people can follow the webinar even if they cannot log in now. So let's now uh, go ahead and I will try to share my screen. Welcome then uh, to the first webinar in the WIMP series of webinars. And uh, this will be on our on ontology from our perspective. And uh, I will begin then at uh, some point later, uh, Celia will take over, present her stuff briefly. And uh, then also Jesper uh, will give a brief perspective from the point of view of the uh, our two projects with, with which we collaborate, the EMMC CSA and the marketplace. We want to have everything under uh, one big umbrella of collaboration because ontology development is about interoperability and this is based on joint work and agreement. And uh, so while this is uh, a presentation from WIMP, the Virtual Materials Marketplace project and uh, what we present here is mostly our work. We do this in uh, close contact and close exchange with those two other projects. And of course, we are uh, very open to uh, collaborations with others, particularly uh, Market 4.0 project, other projects that are uh, aiming at collaborating with us, they're always very welcome. So one big umbrella and uh, as many of you know, 29th of April, there has already been a webinar on ontology. This was done by the EMC CSA project and uh, by Alexander Simperler. And uh, if you have not participated in this webinar, it is available on YouTube on the EMC account. Uh, you can listen to their point of view and uh, some uh, of the aspects that I'm going to mention uh, build on those uh, and uh, EMMC with their work, they uh, formulate a basis on which the other projects can build. They have the EMMO, they have developed MODA and so on and so on. And we build on this. Okay, now uh, disclaimer, we have a uh, contact for announcements where, where you can uh, register to, uh, to get on a mailing list of some uh, sort of uh, distribute, distri distributor, uh, which is this contact, WIMP webinar at iFarmFoundHover.de. If you want to uh, subscribe, then just give them a brief notice. And uh, since this is intended to be the first webinar out of a series, you are very welcome to uh, suggest topics that we should cover and we can do this as WIMP, or we can do this jointly as a collaboration between the projects. So what is WIMP? Just most of you are aware of this. Let me just mention it. It's a Horizon 2020 project, virtual materials marketplace. And uh, we are now about one year and a half into the project out of four years. The aim is to build a platform, as it says here, user-friendly hub, where stakeholders, people who are involved in materials modeling can register and can collaborate. And uh, the main official aim is to have an accelerated speed of development from the point of view of industry. On the other hand, from the point of view of model providers, academics, engineering offices, the aim is also to help them at acquiring, uh, yeah, uh, funds and projects by contact to industry and other end users. Uh, then you can see that not only we are very determined in pursuing this goal, uh, we also are uh, quite a relaxed crowd. And uh, here you find a list of the project partners, including ourselves, the UKRI Science and Technology Facilities Council, and 
the coordination of the project is with uh, Fraunhofer Institute uh, for Manufacturing Technology and Applied uh, Material Science in Bremen, IFAM, and uh, so this is the group involved in this project. And uh, crucial, so here you can see what we aim to accomplish within the project as a whole, within the marketplace platform that we're building together. Uh, so different sites need to come together on a market. That's what any market wants, uh, needs to accomplish. And the crucial concept that you see here in the middle is translation, is bringing together the site of the model provider with the site of the end user. And uh, the translator as a role is a uh, new profile that uh, is being shaped by uh, the EMMC community. What is a translator? And uh, to facilitate this, that uh, to solve the, uh, the problem of the gap between academics who develop models and industrial engineering that requires the solutions. And uh, so the WIMP marketplace will be a platform for translation, but it will also be a platform for training resources, training courses, data, and uh, it will include a simulation platform where uh, simulation workflows that have been defined can actually be executed. So that much about this. This is general, but you see that it brings many sites together, many perspectives. So by, a, by construction, by the very approach, this requires interoperability and it requires agreeing on common terms and standards. So this is why ontology development plays a role in this project. Now, here we deal with semantic asset development, correct? We want to uh, have uh, interoperability, not mainly, for example, at the syntactic level. This would require all developers to agree on file formats and so on and so on. This would be a traditional approach. Instead, we follow the more modern approach, which is also the one championed by the EMC and by our other partner projects to have the uh, interoperability at a semantic level so that the solutions themselves at a technical level, at the level of the file format, do not necessarily have to be at an agreement. The agreement is achieved by having a common framework to express what everything means, what we're talking about. So it's semantics. And uh, the basis for this particular line of development is the review of materials modeling, ROM, a uh, document that uh, those involved with the EMC are familiar with. And uh, that was also discussed by Alexandra in her previous webinar. This is a human readable document. It's not machine readable. And it defines what sort of materials modeling approaches there are and a certain vocabulary that uh, we employ together. And on this basis, MODA has been developed as an important semantic asset. This is a graph language and uh, not a formally a European standard, but a, a standard uh, standardization document, let's say. Uh, so it uh, has been developed as outcome of a CEN workshop. It's a CEN workshop agreement. <laughs> And uh, there we can define workflows. However, this asset is also not immediately machine readable. It is human readable and uh, the diagrams can of course be processed by computers, uh, but it is uh, not yet at the full level of uh, semantic asset development that can potentially be reached. Okay. And there are other assets uh, uh, that are under development. And uh, presumably, you are familiar with the hierarchy of semantic assets, which was also introduced by Alexandra in her previous webinar. Uh, there are more simple assets, and there are more complex assets. And the highest level of development is uh, the ontology, where in a formal way, we define what sort of entities exist, and what relations between entities exist depending on the classes to which those entities belong. 
So that's what we aim at in the end. And while there are many ways to express an ontology, in particular, it could be just human readable text. This would also be an ontology. There are more common ways of doing that are uh, uh, all machine readable. So this also facilitates integration with modern data technology, non-relational databases, reasoners, and so on and so on. This is why we aim at ontology development. And this is why, for example, the EMMC CSA project invests so much effort into developing the European Materials Modeling Ontology EMMO. And now we're not going to talk about uh, the EMMO in this talk. This was the previous webinar. Here, now I would like to uh, focus on marketplace level ontology development. So dealing with the data technology and the concepts that are required to operate a virtual marketplace, but by implication, because the virtual marketplace relates with so many other uh, platforms, those same concepts will also be relevant to those other platforms. So as a basis for our collaboration, we need to agree, first of all, at an upper level. Now, the upper level, strictly speaking, for our work is the EMMO. This is an uh, uh, ontology that covers anything that can exist in the universe. This is a truly upper level ontology. Now below this, we need to establish what are the irreducible concepts that we have to deal with in development of virtual marketplace platforms. And uh, this is the task that is dealt, uh, that we in WIMP deal with, but the same way our sister project, the marketplace project, deals with the same sort of problem. And uh, for that reason, also to facilitate being interoperable in the future when those both, both platforms actually exist, we agreed on a list of fundamental concepts. And we call those the fundamental paradigmatic categories. Fundamental because they're irreducible. So a model is not the same as a role, for example. Uh, and the common upper classes would be very abstract, would be something like entity or something like this. So in this sense, they're irreducible. That's why they're fundamental. And we call them paradigmatic because these concepts are crucial to the paradigm of what a virtual marketplace in matrix modeling is. So we came up with those two, uh, 12 concepts. We came up with a, a common definition. Also, some of them can be immediately related to the EMMO. So we have the contact to uh, the upper level in the strict sense. And in this way, we have also structured the ontology development at a lower level. This is the marketplace level, uh, as, as I call it. So for example, if we have an ontology, if we have a fundamental category that is called communication, the statements that people can exchange, stakeholders can exchange at the marketplace, then it makes sense to develop an ontology for this particular branch for communication. The same goes for simulation, uh, assessment, and so on and so on. This is not meant to be a, a strict constraint that uh, any ontology that we develop on this basis needs to deal with exactly one of those concepts, but it facilitates this by giving a basic structure. And on this, ba uh, on this basis, we've been in discussion with the marketplace project, uh, with Georg and Younes, uh, how to work together. And they have uh, uh, developed part of this and we develop part of this and there's also some overlap, but uh, we uh, are on, on, the, on the way to building these ontologies at a marketplace level jointly and coming to an agreement. And in this way, those platforms will be interoperable. So as a summary of this basic approach from uh, the EMC work, we have EMMO, which is being released and so has already been presented uh, at a quite detailed level. Uh, then we have MODA and from our agreement, we have the European Virtual Marketplace Ontology, EVMPO. And in this way, what we define, 
will become the basis of a European virtual marketplace, virtual marketplace framework that contains our two platforms that we develop, but could also contain other platforms if they just adhere to these common standards. Below that, we develop a series of marketplace level ontologies that we have defined them. We have now communicated the uh, first draft version of those ontologies. For example, uh, ontology that formalizes MODA. This one is called OSMO. I will present that. Ontology on training, uh, ontology on software. Silvia will present this one, and so on and so on. And this is now at a very early stage of development. We have now the first draft version. This is available within our project. It is available to the colleagues from the Marketplace project and other interested people can contact us and then we will come into an exchange. Uh, also, we have shown this work to uh, Emanuele Gadini so that uh, he can uh, comment on this from his point of view. We have been in exchange on this. And uh, below this, these ontologies have in common that they will be used to guide input of data and processing of data by the marketplace platforms. Uh, then there are other types of information, more detailed information that are needed to, for example, actually operate a simulation in detail to execute it on an open simulation platform, for example. Those are subdomain specific ontologies and uh, also, uh, Silvia will comment on this, and I will start by discussing the marketplace level ontologies. So, they are now at a first draft stage, which is good because now we are in a discussion together. And uh, any remarks that you have or any suggestions for development that you have can influence this development. Uh, and most of them are, for that reason, quite simple, so containing not too many concepts like we have here. In this case, this is the ontology for communication. What sort of messages do we expect people to exchange in uh, on the marketplace? Now, when we discuss ontologies, you will always see them uh, represented as graphs. Let me uh, explain the basic structure. You see, uh, yeah, all those uh, Ellipses, those represent classes. And the arrows here represent what is called is a, or in old formalism, the subclass relationship. As we know it, for example, from object oriented programming, a class can have a subclass. This is the subclass relationship. Beside this relationship, there are many other relations defined between objects of those classes by the ontology. And there are rules that uh, can restrain the types of relations uh, and that uh, can uh, facilitate logical reasoning uh, so that even if something is not stated explicitly, it can be inferred on the basis of the rules. And this is not shown in those diagrams. So even if here you see only uh, arrows containing is this doesn't mean that, for example, uh, other relations don't exist. Um, okay, and here, we need to uh, build a connection to the other topics. For example, communication could be on translation, an exchange related to translation, uh, and uh, other communications could be related to legal formalisms, quotations, and so on and so on, things that can occur on, from a legal point of view at the marketplace. And uh, here we aim at covering those concepts, integrating them into the ontology, connecting the different marketplace level ontologies in this way. For example, the ontology for communication needs to be connected to the ontology for translation and so on and so on. And they all are connected to the European virtual marketplace ontology, which we have at a higher level. For example, communication is defined in the EDMPO. And again, those are connected to the EMMO where possible. And this is the first draft. While our development of the platform and the other concepts evolves, those ontologies will co-evolve. 
now let us look at a topic that is particularly important, which is simulation workflows. Simulation workflows are, of course, important uh, if we want to uh, execute a simulation, for example, on a simulation platform. But beside that, they, uh, they are also the crucial metadata for any simulation result that we want to store. Because if we want to store it with the full relevant information, we need to say how the data have been generated. So we need to make statements on the, uh, on the data provenance. And the data provenance for simulation results is particularly characterized by the simulation workflow. For that reason, it is absolutely necessary to, de to evolve what we have here to develop moda, moda graphs, like uh, they were presented in the previous webinar, into an ontology, because only then it can be integrated with semantic data technology. So that's, that's what, what we need to work with here. And uh, to recall the basic structure of MODA, MODA defines the uh, four granularity levels of materials modeling that already go back to the ROM document, electronic modeling, atomistic, mesoscopic, and continuum level. And it defines four uh, different types of, uh, of sections or elements that characterize part of a simulation workflow. This would be the user case, the problem that we deal with, then the model, strictly speaking. Uh, so the basic physical approach that we follow theoretically. And then the solver, which is the numerical realization of the, of the model. And uh, beside this processing, uh, uh, which is defined very generously to include anything that is not directly operating in terms of the variables included in the governing equations. So the MODA approach uh, includes many processing steps as processing that would technically be realized not as an actual processor, that would be realized together with a solver. This is a logical distinction. It is not a technical distinction. Okay, so, and then we have connections. They are here represented by those blue arrows between the elements, um, in some cases with uh, semantics that are very well defined. In other cases, the semantics behind those arrows are more intuitively defined. Now we have to represent this as an ontology. And uh, we want to uh, stay as close to the approach that has been introduced. So what we do is translate MODA more or less one-to-one -to, -one to an ontology. Uh, so for example, uh, we have a user case. This is a MODA user case. The user case has aspects and they are, for example, uh, those that you find in the MODA document, uh, the MODA definition, there's also an EMC website. These would be uh, the aspects of a user case that you have here, material, geometry, time span simulated, process, and so on and so on. And uh, we have classes corresponding to those. And we have relations that link a user case to those aspects that, is ha that it has in a particular case. Uh, so in this diagram, you see the subclass relationship but you see also a relation that is not a subclass relationship. It is the has aspect relation, which has subrelations corresponding to those fields. So whenever somebody, for example, fills in the MODA form by hand or with a web front end developed by our colleagues from the marketplace project, which have, who have a nice web front end for this, this could now be translated one-to-one -one into, uh, yeah, triples, statements that are compatible with an ontology. And the same goes for the other sections, user case, model, solver, and processor. They all have the aspects. And the way that we do this is consistent with MODA. And this is the uh, uh, class hierarchy associated with it. And in processor, case of processor, because the processor uh, is defined logically, not technically. Uh, there are different types of processors that can be distinguished, distinguished in particular, processing can occur at any time. It's not necessary that it occurs as post-processing. It can also be realized as processing 
during simulation time and can be before simulation time and so on and so on. So, so much about this, how, to, how we deal with the moda sections in ontology, but we need to do more. We need to define the whole simulation workflow. So we integrate this representation of moda into an ontology, the ontology for simulation modeling and optimization, abbreviated OSMO. OSMO is the ontology version of MODA, and uh, it allows us to represent MODA workflows with a clear semantics that is well specified as it is necessary for us. We have to do this to, uh, to be able to work with workflows. And because this is a semantic asset, by implication, this is not only compatible with MODA. It is most directly compatible with MODA, but of course, any workflows in materials modeling can be described semantically in these terms, whether they have been defined by MODA or whether they have been defined by any other approach that exists. So in this way, we uh, increase interoperability between approaches that employ workflow technology. So here we have the, uh, on top, the workflow notation from MODA uh, and uh, now to uh, illustrate how we deal with this uh, semantically to make it more explicit what is actually happening. Let us zoom into the uh, region where we have the uh, solver and the processor. Uh, here we introduce, uh, this is now an extended graph notation mainly just to show the concepts. Beside the sections that we have, the solver and the processor, logical resources. The logical resources formalize what sort of data are exchanged. So a uh, solver has write access to a resource to which the post processor has read access. This is how we formalize uh, what sort of data are exchanged. And of course, this write access uh, specifies what sort of data are exchanged and also specifies when this occurs. For the solver, here in this example, this occurs finally after execution of the solver. For the processor, the read access occurs initially while we start the processing. So, and uh, we embed all those objects, logical resources and sections in a graph. And this graph <coughs> structure, uh, as it's defined here as an ontology, uh, uh, and here you see some of the relations, part of the uh, other relations that are defined for those. Uh, the graph can be of different types. In particular, it becomes a workflow, which is a particular kind of simulation object whenever the graph shows a full workflow that is executable. This is then a simulation because a simulation means that it has to be executable. The part that we have here is not executable. For example, there is no information on the model. Uh, and with a special case, which is the Moda node, the Moda node contains a single uh, section. And uh, those workflows and nodes are connected with particular relations that say uh, whether we have coupling or linking and what type of coupling and linking between parts of a workflow. So in this way, we want to formalize it to make uh, more explicit what, the, what those workflows actually mean. This is Osmo. Uh, and uh, beside this, let me now focus on one other ontology where it would be particularly helpful to uh, get into exchange within the community. This is what uh, we call the ontology for training services. However, it is not only related for training. So what was our basic challenge here? We need to be able to specify uh, what courses are offered, what training materials are offered, and uh, at a marketplace, for example. There can be open educational resources or people offer them for pay and so on and so on. And fortunately, uh, much of what one, need to, what one would need to describe those entities can already be described perfectly well with pre-existing ontologies. For example, we have uh, the information artifact ontology, which deals with documents, 
and uh, it's enough for many purposes. Then we have a calendar ontology developed by the World Wide Web Consortium. Of course, we can use this to uh, cover scheduling issues related to events, to courses. We have the course curriculum and syllabus ontology by which we can already describe in principle course syllabi and a course consists of lectures and units and so on. This can all be dealt with. So what we needed to develop here is how to apply this particularly to materials modeling. And uh, this it comes into play when we want to describe a learning outcome because the learning outcome uh, needs to be formulated in topics that are specific to materials modeling. So this is where we need to develop a taxonomy about the topics that exist in materials modeling. And we have started doing that and uh, come up with a basic structure also uh, on the basis of input that we have received from our project partners who have already conducted a series of courses, for example, uh, Alta Scuola Politecnica in Italy have given us some input the, uh, and the colleagues from uh, Czech Academy of Sciences have also given us some input. It's a basic structure and uh, we want to develop this into a taxonomy of topics and uh, as far as possible, connect this and integrate this with the taxonomies that already exist. For example, the PEX scheme that many will know from, uh, for example, Journal of Chemical Physics. There's an ACM classification. Springer has their classification. Then there's a classification DDC induced by libraries and so on and so on. And uh, this sort of statements that we want to be able to make, statements on learning outcomes, uh, are formalized. Now we need to introduce a certain standard notation. This is the standard notation that we have to, for to formalize a learning outcome after completing X1, which is a course, participants can do something. That's why it's a competency, something that one can do. This is the operator with respect to X3, which is the operand. This would be a topic, for example, by doing, this is an illustration. For example, X5, another illustration. So uh, we have now discussed the topics. We developed this, the taxonomy of the topics, but we also need a catalog of operators, what people are able to do. And we cannot take something generic. This has to uh, be defined for technical fields. Fortunately, there is an asset for this already available. Uh, this has been uh, introduced by the German Conference of uh, Cultural Ministries, KMK. And uh, there you have uh, the types of operators of competency descriptors that you see here, some related predominantly to basic competencies and the same for intermediate advanced competencies. So clearly at a more advanced stage of learning, people would be ready to propose a hypothesis as we have here as an example, whereas uh, at a more basic level, people will be able to name what sort of concepts exist, for example. And uh, in this way, we can make those statements and uh, we are now ready to describe what people want to achieve by a course, what people can learn from a document, and so on and so on. However, this is not the only use of competencies that we have on the marketplace. We also want to be able to uh, include in our platform statements that stakeholders, for example, experts make about themselves. If you register as a translator, then you need to be able to state, I, the translator so-and-so, am able to provide qualified advice, uh, for example, design simulation workflows in mesoscopic materials modeling. So beside those competencies that relate more to uh, students, we need competencies that are more appropriate for experts who uh, are actually developing a field or managing projects and so on and so on. So we need to extend this by expert competencies, which we have done here, for example, to advise, manage, and so on. Someone who has experience, uh, for example, as a uh, faculty, university faculty, or to conduct experiments, or to write papers, and so on and so on. Those are expert competencies, introducing 
a fourth level that extends the catalog that we have taken over from previous work. So now let's look at a full picture. Uh, what is the architecture of semantic assets that we're developing jointly? At the top of everything, of course, we have the European Materials Modeling Ontology, and uh, this will shape everything that comes below. Then here we have an agreement, the European Virtual Marketplace Ontology, and outside in black, uh, here we have semantic assets developed by others that have a close relation. So Osmo, for example, is the ontology version of Moda. So of course, it's closely related to Moda and it's related to the review of materials modeling and to metadata schemas developed by others. Then we have the ontology for uh, training services, also related to ontologies that already exist, and so on and so on, the full set of marketplace level ontologies that I have now briefly introduced. How do we realize this technically? Uh, the ontologies are within the logical level defined by all description language, all DL. The format that we use is the terse triple language, also called turtle language. So it's a turtle format. Uh, you see uh, an example down here. Um, it's defined like other expressions of all as triples, subject, predicate, object. So a subject has a property uh, that relates it to another object. Uh, and uh, this is, how this, is uh, how this is done. And the notation is quite compact. And uh, that's why uh, it is quite popular. Um, now, what sort of relations do we have? Uh, you have already seen in the examples a few uh, relations that are not subclass relationships. For example, a workflow contains sections. A workflow can, for example, contain a, a model and a solver and a processor and so on. Or the different parts of the workflow can be linked to each other. So those were already properties. And as a whole, you see that we have over 200 types of relations that are defined in our ontologies. However, they are categorized. Uh, we are still working on the implementation of this, but by a compatibility requirement with the EMMO. These relations all need to be either subclass relationship or one of those three categories that you have here that are defined by the EMMO. Membership, representation, and parthood. I will not discuss this further in detail because Alexandra has already done that in her previous webinar. Now, the main reason why we introduce all those ontologies at the marketplace level is that we need to integrate information into our data technology that we implement. So we need to be able to input data, and this problem is data ingest. So put data into some platform. So this means that when we characterize an object, we need to request and supply all the information that is needed to create an object in object-oriented programming, the analog to this would be to construct an object. So information would need to be provided to a constructor. For that reason, uh, let us now compare how ontologies and object-oriented programming deal with objects and their properties, which is fundamentally different. That's why we need to have an eye on this. So imagine that we have a class A that has uh, two different subclasses, B and C. In object-oriented programming, any of those uh, classes and the instances can have methods and other properties. So for example, we could say method PA is defined for class A and so on for the classes B and C. Then, because class B is a subclass of A, all instances of class B will inherit the properties and methods defined for class A. Inheritance in object orientation goes from a superclass to the subclass. Uh, objects of class A have the method PA. Objects of class B are objects of class A, hence they also have the method PA. Now what we need to pay attention to is that for semantic technology, in particular ontologies, uh, 
the basic paradigm underlying all of this is a semantic web. This means anybody can make any statement and uh, in principle, we're not restricting anything any except by rules that one can introduce, but the basic approach does not restrict this. So for that reason, the implication is exactly the other way around. We do not say all objects of class A have the property PA. Instead, we say, if an object is found to have the property PA, it must be of class A. And the same goes with PB and PC. If an object has a relation PB, it belongs to class B, and so on and so on. Uh, for this reason, inheritance at a very basic level in ontologies works the other way around. Uh, uh, an entity that uh, has the property or relation PB is an object of class B. However, because it, B is subclass of A, it is also an object of class A. So what I have defined for class B is propagated upward to the superclass, not the other way around. If we want to construct objects, then what we need to implement is actually the paradigm from object and the programming. So we need to incorporate it somehow into our ontologies. Imagine the scenario uh, as we have defined here, the classes A, B, and C. A user wants to create a object of class B. For example, imagine class A is a person. Now someone wants to register on a marketplace platform, but not as an abstract person. He wants to register as a software owner. Class B would be software owner, A would be person. We have defined that every person has a name. Uh, of course, when creating an instance of software owner, we want to ask the person who registers for their name. So we need to know at a technical level that uh, has name is a relation that belongs both to class A and to class B, even though we only define it for class A. And how do we do that? By creating an obviously oriented hierarchy of classes that describe object properties. Object property of B, object property of A, object property of C. And in this way, we can uh, obtain the inheritance relation that we need. So imagine we now create an object of class B. And the problem is, what questions do we ask the user? So we make a query for individuals that belong to the class object property of B. And this would include the object properties defined for A because OPA is a subclass of OPB. And in this way, the user will be asked the questions that are pertinent to the object that he wants to create. In particular, when he creates an object of type B, he will be asked for the name. If we create a software owner, he will be asked for the name, even though name was defined as a property of a person. Good. So this, uh, with this uh, statement on how we implement all of this, uh, I would uh, now let us switch and uh, Silva will make a brief statement on her level. Thank you, Martin. So what I will present now very briefly is uh, another one of the marketplace level ontologies, which is the Beam software ontology. We call it BISO. So the purpose here is to describe software for materials modeling uh, at the level of capabilities. Uh, so both model and solver aspects, licensing requirements where we intend, uh, for example, dependencies from libraries or requirements when it comes to operating systems, and also compatibility with other tools. Where with compatibility, we follow the distinction that uh, Emanuele Ghedini has proposed between compatibility and interoperability, as it is outlined at the bottom of the, of the slide. Where with compatibility, we mean that two uh, systems are able to exchange information directly, so there is no need to interface. Whereas we don't interoperability, we mean that the exchange happens through a common language. Uh, so for example, if we say that two software tools are compatible, it means that they can natively uh, work together. So this ontology 
will be used to structure the, the ingestion of information on the marketplace. So for example, the software providers and owners will provide this information, fill this information on the marketplace. And then the same keywords that we define will be available to the users to, to browse the tools that are available and to compare them. So on the right, you can see the categories that are defined at the upper level. So agents, software, with which we intend both a computer program uh, that can be a tool like an engine or a processor, like a preprocessor or a postprocessor, or an operating system. Then you have obvious categories like programming language and so on. I will not go through this. Um, you have property where, for example, we intend that uh, if we are defining a post-processing tool, we can say, we can make statements like this tool will allow to compute property X uh, based on theory Y, and theory will be defined under the modeling related entity branch. So these are the kind of concepts we will cover. Uh, when it comes to the main properties we can define in this ontology, you can see them on the left. They describe the features that a tool has. As I said, uh, they assert compatibility and so on. Uh, they say whether the software is free, so open source, and so on. You find an example on the right in uh, the Turtle format, where we are describing uh, the Alpoli, which is a software tool. And you can see, for example, we are saying, uh, is this open source? It is distributed by SDFC. We give a web page as a reference. We are saying it is a tool for model molecular mechanics and so on. Uh, it is compatible with these other tools and so on and so forth. Then this is, um, concerns the marketplace level. At a lower level, we are also developing subdomain specific ontologies. With this, uh, we mean much more detailed information will be needed to describe in detail the settings, the input and the output of the tools. So basically all the variables that are entering the simulations. What is this needed for? So this is needed for semantic interoperability between the codes in a simulation platform. It is needed to check for consistency and completeness of the inputs of a simulation and to document the, the results of simulations. When we talk about subdomains, we, we have in mind classes of similar methods, as Martin already mentioned, as for example, particle-based simulations, continuous simulations, and so on. And I would like to mention that at, the sim at this level, um, some assets with a similar purpose have been developed within other European projects, namely the Nomad project and the Symphony project. And in the latter, Cuba codes have been defined, which are common universal Unify data structure and basic attributes, and you can find links to this material. And with this, I think I would hand over to Jasper. Try to turn on the camera now. Ah, oh, wait. Uh, can you show my? Before we hand over to uh, to, to Jasper, let's. Uh... Uh, ah, this is okay. It's just a final statement, but I just wanted to uh, again uh, recall that uh, you can register for future announcements by writing the colleagues under this address. Anyway, the material will be available to you, and there you can look it up again. So, okay, let's. Is it easiest that you are showing the seats again? Yeah. Uh, my slides. Or should I? Try to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. Yes, are you ready? Uh, yep. I, is it shared? Uh, 
try to share your screen. And now I, now I think maybe I need to press this button here. Do you see something now? Or did I move it away? Yes, it works. So what do you see? Do you see the... I see Google. Oh, that was not what I want to show you. <laughs> now it's in the slide. Perfect. So what I want to show, very short here, what I want to show you is just a possible use, how we have been discussing uh, ontologies, and especially EMMO can be used in the marketplace project. So um, we have, uh, it's based on EMMO on the top. The marketplace project, we see that, right, maybe I want to start here at the, at the left figure. So, so here, we, marketplace project uh, like uh, VIMS want really to offer possibilities for the users to explore data, get access to yeah, knowledge, to get access to translators, and to get access to actually simulation uh, tools and workflows. Uh, and in order to connect, so if you have a set of tools and you want actually to run a workflow, connecting several applications. That is just, uh, so the case I want to show is a, a way, a quite early picture we made uh, while we designed our, uh, the architecture. But I think these slides here are quite, quite useful anyway. So at the top here, we have this EMMO in a, this a common repos representational system that constitutes what uh, you have in uh, marketplace. Then, uh, so uh, that uh, all applications communicate via. And then it creates an ontology, extended ontology, like the ontology you showed just before for VIMS. A similar uh, will be done for in marketplace. You have applications that connects to this ontology. And really in order to achieve interoperability between two uh, or uh, applications, what you need to do is to create a link. C can you make a link from application A to a, a, our common representational system? You can uh, use the same uh, methodology to create a link to the other uh, application. So it's same, essentially everything boils down to being able to map between this marketplace ontology and the ontology for the application. Of course, applications often uh, do not have an explicit stated ontology that is formal, but they, they, are, they, are all, they, they exist here as informal ontologies uh, that can be described in a, by a translator, it's creating an interface around the, the application that actually can communicate with the marketplace. So let's see if I managed to... So, this, this is more or less what I just said. So the interoperability really boils down to being able to map between the uh, ontologies for the common representational system and the uh, interfaces around your applications. And of, when, you are, you, when you're working practically, you, uh, you need to translate the classes in the ontology to metadata and what then the mapping actually becomes uh, mapping between instances of uh, metadata for the different uh, system uh, for the different ontologies so to be a little more concrete i try to show it again so here we have two ontologies and we really want to be able to have information that we express in ontology one, mapped, uh, uh, represented in ontology two. So we have ontology one, we can from this, the different classes in the ontology one, we can 
generate or create metadata that correspond to that. This metadata is really semantically well defined via the ontology. Instances of, so this metadata could, for instance, be a class in Python or C, or it could be a struct in C++, it could be a struct. That's not so important. The important is that this metadata really describes its data. Down, down here, so it describes the data instances. So here we have uh, some data instances, and they, they are well defined via the ontology one. But now in a, in a, this is typically in a software system that is very hands-on, low level. We can then do, and this, uh, we can then perform a mapping from this, this is a, to uh, an instance described in another met, uh, metadata that is uh, related to an, another ontology. I guess it's semantics from that ontology. And this is, uh, the, the mapping down here, if you have a common system that really form the metadata, you can actually start here to, to do this mapping very efficiently. Uh, I'm not sh shown anything here, but we have a, actually a, a system that works this way here, where we have a metadata representation that f f f the, what we call entities, and these entity, the instances of these entities can then be mapped between each other. These mappings are so far not something that uh, has to be handwritten. In principle, if these two ontologies are connected via both actually are based on EMMO, it might be possible for a very clever program to, uh, in a, to a last second uh, actually in a degree, automate the generation of these mappings. For units, for instance, it's a quite trivial task, but uh, that is something uh, we, we have been discussing, it's definitely not something uh, we are close to approaching. So, so that was just three slides I wanted to show, going back to the first one, how we have been thinking about more concrete using ontologies to perform actually mapping between applications such that we can run a workflow where these different applications actually communicate seamless with each other. They don't know anything about each other. They're using the ontology and the marketplace APIs to, to facilitate this uh, interoperability. I hope that made, made sense and, uh, for you. I will have yeah, to- Yeah, thanks. Yep. I'm, I will handle over the screen to you again. Good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can see, uh, of course, the uh, basic approach that we have is close. <laughs> That's clear. Okay. So we're through with the uh, presentation part. Now this is open uh, to discussion. Any remarks? Objections? There are quite a few people. Good, I mean, uh, let us wait half a minute if anyone comes up with uh, things to discuss. And if not, then of course we will conclude this and the recording will be available. Will you also make your presentation available? Uh, the, my slides are already available, they are on my website. And uh, besides this, I hope that the EMC will uh, upload the video recording. Okay, then. Sorry, I just wanted to say something. I prepared a new web page for MO, if you would like to take a look. So I, it's on the main EMMC website. Uh, and um, so it's something I've done in collaboration with Gerard and um, Adam. Uh, so if you would like to express your opinion uh, and give me some feedback, that would be great, I think. Yeah, do you want to share it now? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, let me see how to do that. Uh, yeah, so there it is, yeah. Um, 
I've designed it with the main uh, WordPress uh, editor. I mean, it's not too... Wait, wait, wait. Let's share your screen. Go to screen sharing. Oh, sorry, sorry. Screen sharing. Oh, sorry. I just sent the link. Uh, let me see how to do it. Yeah. So yeah, this is the main web page. Yeah? So it's quite basic, but uh, I would like to include more information in the future. So it starts with a brief introduction to ontologies in general for people who are not necessarily experts. And then uh, I go on into the details about emo. So I introduce emo. Uh, and then uh, I included some of the webinars from YouTube that we already had. Um, including the one by Emanuele Ghedini. Uh, so this is the one by uh, Alex, uh, Alexandra uh, Simpater. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I then include similar initiatives uh, and a link to our main uh, GitHub repository and um, related events, uh, links, uh, uh, contact forms, uh, of course. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, it's quite basic, but if you like to provide more input or uh, suggestions. Um, you can always uh, send me an email um, or send it to Garrett. Yeah, many thanks. Looks okay. nice. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Comments, question, questions on this or any other thing? Good, then uh, I would like to thank you all for, uh, for joining us and uh, as you all know, there will be some future events on ontologies where we can continue all these discussions. And uh, there's a lot to do in the future. Uh, let's continue. Many thanks. Have a good time. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.